is advised. Hey everyone, welcome back to Fat National Run Throughs, and this time I'm actually doing something new for the channel. Um, didn't really get a chance for 2016 or 2017, but I am on top of it this year for 2018, and that is I'm going to be doing my top 20 games of, uh, or anticipated games of 2018. So, there were a lot, a lot of good games that came out in 2017, and it's just going to get better from here. So, 2018 is looking to be a promising year, and uh, I'm actually, I'm, not, I'm, I'm excited. I'm actually very excited because I have 20 games. Actually, I have a little bit more than that. But, not only do I have these 20 games, there's going to be way more than that that obviously come out in the year that, you know, haven't even been mentioned, or I just, you know, I was like, hey, I don't know if that's going to be any good, but then it, it ends up being awesome and I end up getting it. And also games that I end up buying for the channel, so, uh, so we can do run-throughs for. But, here we go. So, I'm actually going to start off with an honorable mention. And I know the reason why it's an honorable mention is because it actually came out in 2017, but I will not be getting my copy until 2018, and that is Seventh Continent. Seventh Continent is one of those games that came out that was wildly successful, wildly popular, and it came out with a second Kickstarter to be able to provide more of that content, and I definitely jumped in on that. It's actually the first Kickstarter game I went all in on because I just know I'm going to like that. that sense of just open world exploration, figuring out, you know, you know, card crafting and card exploring, I don't know what I was trying to say there, and just kind of being dropped into a world and it's like, have fun, figure it out, just seems like it'd be right up my alley. And uh, one, I also know it's going to be awesome for the channel because I'll probably do a solo series for that on top of all the other series that I already do. Uh, hopefully I'll be done with Gloomhaven by then. But, yeah, so it's an honorable mention because it is already out technically, and it's, so it is a 2017 game that I couldn't put on 2017. Now, uh, let's get on to the actual list, you know, of authentic games that are coming out in 2018. And, you know, one of those games is actually... It, okay, it's going to be really weird because, like, uh, it, it, it's Jim Henson's The Dark Crystal, the board game. Uh... So you should see a, uh, a picture of it right here, and I'm just kind of, I have my computer here to go over the, the list of games, and so I can give accurate descriptions, because obviously these games are not, so I can only go by what I, what everyone else knows. I absolutely love The Dark Crystal and uh, everything that Jim Henson brought to that, to that movie. So, I mean, it seems like it's going to be a family game. Which is understandable because it's the Dark Crystal, which is funny, but that, game, that movie's like really dark, and a lot of families like actually don't like it, and a lot of kids probably don't like it. But I definitely watched it as an adult, like l like half a year ago, and just love it. Cat hates it, but she's normally wrong when it comes to the movies. <laughs> hey, uh, I don't know. All the description says is, will Jen and, and Kira manage to find the shard and heal the Dark Crystal? Find out in Jim Henson's The Dark Crystal board game. Like, there's nothing else to this. Uh, I don't even know if it's, if it's even a thing, but it is available for pre-order. I know that much. Yeah, age is six and up. I, I, I still have to give it a shot because it's The Dark Crystal and I love it, so that's why it's at number 20. Number... 19 is a game I actually happened to play on uh, while I was at Gen Con, got to playtest it there, and uh, while it's set in a world I know nothing about, it the game itself is actually really awesome, and that is Firefly Brigands and Brown Coats. So, this game uh, it probably would have been higher had I actually been a Firefly fan, which I, I mean, I don't hate it because I know nothing about it. All I know is that they didn't finish the show because whoever was running that, I think, I want to say Fox? Could be wrong there. Uh, fucked it up. So, it has a huge cult following, and while I, I would imagine that this game, kind of like Battlestar Galactica, would get me to want to watch the show, just to be more involved in the theme. But other than that, I actually did get to play it, and the, the mechanics and everything were really solid. It was really cool because the building stuff actually had little boxes that you could go into, um, and there were reactions then. There was a bunch of stuff, depending on if you were... Um, oh, what was it? I'm gonna call it raging, that's not what it was, but if you were suspicious or something, you could walk in and just talk to people and have encounters while trying to talk to them based on your skill, or you could just be aggressive and just start killing people. So it was, it was a lot of fun. Uh, the people I was playing with, 
uh, were pretty cool too. So that's why it is 19 brigands and brown coats. Now, number 18 is actually an expansion for a very loved game of mine called Robinson Crusoe The Lost City of Z. Now, I never said expansions couldn't be on this list because uh, sometimes games just need expansions and then that, that just makes it me even more excited for that game. Now, so Lost City of Z is actually a big, uh, what it's saying is a big expansion for Robinson Crusoe. Uh, Voyage of the Beagle, which I do own and have played, is a lot of fun. It definitely brought a lot more theme into Robinson Crusoe, already more than it had already. Already more than it had. Omit that second already. And, and then just, you just want more in this world. And I know a lot of people made, there were a lot of fan-made scenarios that are really good that the, um, you know, second printing, you know, the, the updated Robinson Crusoe actually included. So, uh, Lost City of Z is definitely going to be awesome. Follows another great explorer, Lieutenant Colonel Percy Fawcett. His expedition went deep into the Amazon rainforest in the search for a hidden civilization in the mythical Lost City of Z. So, I think they can continue doing stuff like this with Robinson Crusoe. Um, I mean, at this point, it's no longer Robinson Crusoe. It's just, hey, we're just doing the same mechanic with a different theme. You know, Charles Darwin, and then also now it looks like Lieutenant Colonel Percy Fawcett. But they could do a bunch of stuff, and it, it almost makes me feel like Uncharted, the game, where you just do different, all these different, um, uh, what does it say, like, mythical things, that, that expeditions, like, uh, hey, let's go find El Dorado, there's probably gonna be one, Robinson Crusoe, the search for El Dorado, or something like that. But, I mean, anything more with Robinson Crusoe, and I'll be pretty happy with, because it's, it's, uh, one of my favorite games. So that was 18. Then there is 17, a game that actually just came to my attention called Archmage. Archmage seems to be a game that seems like right up my alley. One to four players and a few magically talented individuals, their devoted followers in tow, have been drawn from their villages across the twisted wilderness to the ruined city. Uh, there's actually a lot of information to this. It's kind of like magic has pretty much died and you... Uh, are trying to go around the land collecting all these relics and, and says followers and train apprentices to get uh, spheres of magic and beyond to be able to grow the power of the order and stuff like that. So uh, it, it, it's kind of like a, it says Euro thematic hybrid, which seems really awesome. I mean, yeah, action point allowance system, area control, you know, uh, time tracking, variable player powers, all of those mechanics are in everything that I look for in a game. And the theme seems really cool, too. Uh, at the very heart of the city, the Cursed Tower of Magic rises into the broiling clouds. From this vantage, the Archmage and her order of mages ruled these lands for an age, drawing together the warring magics of the mythic races into one all-powerful and cohesive force. That was, of course, before the ending. Duh! There is your drama! So that's the end. Uh, that's the ending. That's it. That's the other one. Um, and yeah, so it's like it, it even explains kind of how goes into and you can get spells and stuff so uh, a lot of games I'm actually seeing are delving more into mages again so a couple years ago it was zombies next, like last year it was first half seemed to be vikings then it went to um mars seemed to be the uh the the theme and a lot of games coming out now are seem to go back into fantasy which is you know that's perfectly fine with me because I love almost everything fantasy so that is Number uh, 20, 19, 18, that's 17. 16 is a game called Cerebria, The Inside World. This game is actually just on Kickstarter, and I had just missed it, but it's it seems like a very unique theme. Like, uh, it's definitely, it's basically based, based like off of these um, emotions. Uh, so, yeah, the spirits invoke emotions inhabiting Cerebria in their service to gain power over the five realms. So... Definitely seems like area control and then, you know, player power is based off emotions. Um, and you kind of buy and fight for, you know, hey, if I do this, then I'll get this power from this emotion, which will allow me to do this. Um, and, I, and I love games like that. Fate of the Elder, it's kind of did that, where you went to specific locations to trigger those abilities to be able to benefit you. And it, it, it just seems really, really cool. Like, uh, I, and, and the miniatures also look pretty awesome in the artwork. It, it's just, it comes from Mind Clash Games also, which, if I'm not mistaken, did, um, like, Anachrony, and, uh, what else did they do? Well, if I could find it. 
Yeah, anachrony. Um, and and tricarion. So, like that in and of itself, pretty much makes me want to just play it anyway because, um, you know, anachrony. <laughs> so uh, I'm very excited for that one. So now that was number sixteen. Number 15 is a game that both uh, Dice Tower and Rado have been, you know, kind of raving about and excited to play that I had to pretty much look it up and see. I'm like, oh, okay, well, what's that game about? It's called Carnival of Monsters. Now, this game is about you are trying to create a carnival of unusual creatures. And while it has something that I don't care a whole lot for, which is set collection, it does have drafting and artwork and a really cool theme. So, yeah, you basically play the sets of cards. If they can do the, like you know mechanics that don't sound really interesting, but make it thematic and make it really cool within the game, then I completely can dismiss my dislike for it. So, set collection seems like it's by Richard Garfield, who did Magic. Uh, and you basically set collect, and what you are set collecting are different lands, which allow you to capture and, and, uh, and display exotic creatures, uh, which allow you to earn victory points. And... Uh, so doesn't that just sound pretty cool? Like, I like I can't think of a carnival game that that delves around. It's almost like uh, oh, what was that? Oh, Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them is kind of what it makes me think of. Just all a bunch of different creatures that you. But instead of you know wanting to release them and house them and take care of them, you want to contain them and be like, look at my carnival uh, of monsters. <laughs> so I guess we'll see. I mean, Richard Garfield. Obviously, everyone loves magic. So. This one has to be, you know, pretty cool, uh, because if he's the one designing it. So we'll see, we'll see. So that was 15. Number 14 is a game that uh, was also on Kickstarter recently, and it's it was a theme that I actually haven't seen before. I mean, I have, you know, obviously I know about it, but I uh, haven't seen it at a board game. And that is The Legends of Sleepy Hollow. Now... Obviously, Sleepy Hollow is a really, really good, uh, you know, world. I actually uh, thoroughly enjoy that lore, and this game looks like it's going to take that and do a really good job with it. So, in this game, uh, you actually uh, follow the the disappearance of, of Ichabod Crane. So you have four Terrytown residents with strange ties to the supernatural venture into an ever-darkening Sleepy Hollow to uncover its mysteries. Uh, you take on the roles of four residents. There's, yeah, Jeremiah Pink. Uh, uh, Pink. Uh, you have Matthias Garreau, Elijah Kappel, and Emily Van Winkle. Uh, and a cooperative miniatures-based campaign game full of secrets and twists. So it seems like there's going to be kind of a campaign that you follow, that you're kind of trying to discover, well, what's going on within this world. And it's just, it, the theme alone is what draws me to it, that I just kind of want to... Uh, you know, explore and be like, okay, well, what's happening in Sleepy Hollow besides the Headless Horseman slaughtering people? Did you guys ever see that in the, the Sleepy Hollow with, um, uh, Wednesday? It's Christina, Christina Ritchie and Johnny Depp. I liked it. Pretty good. Oh, and Christopher Walken. I forgot he was actually the, the Headless Horseman. <laughs> and he, like, makes out with that chick and cuts her face up with his sharp teeth. Um, yeah, so... That, that, that's, uh, what did I say, 14? Legends of Sleepy Hollow. Yeah, so, once again, uh, just a campaign-style game within that world. Seems like it'll do pretty well. Now, this, this, uh, this next game, and I believe another one within it, let me see, yep, another one coming up, is by the, uh, the same designer, not designer, publisher. And this publisher is quickly becoming one of my favorites of all time, and this, uh, for number... Whatever I already forgot, 20, 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, am I on 13? 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Oops, okay, 13. Whoops. Whoopsie. I suck. All right, well, whatever. I mean, I'll know when I get to number one. Uh, em em Empyreal? Empyreal Spells in Steam, I think is how it's pronounced. A uh, game by Level 99 Games, uh, to where this is another game in the world of Endine. So, pretty much because of my love for Battlecon and the other games like that, uh, I just want to know more about that world. Like, I, I want it'd be awesome for a campaign game to just kind of explore that, or a book, <laughs> or a TV series would be awesome. But 
You are technomancers who use mana to build rails, and the amount of mana crystals required to cast a spell varies by terrain and by the potency of the spell. So, the, uh, uh, yeah, the, the, not a whole lot is actually explained within this. Uh, it says it's going to come, uh, I think it was either, I think this one was July for, um, for the release date. But the towns you choose to connect to your network will provide critical resources and the value of these resources change over time. So you're using magic to create uh, rails to connect to these cities and towns and then there's actually, uh, what does it say, um, I mean it's not, it's not cooperative. But, yeah, the resources you use will allow you to probably better, you know, use your spells. So, it seems like it's going to be a game that's interconnected very tightly, and that you kind of want to plan ahead with your, with your actions. And so, it's level 99, and almost every game that they make, for me, anyway, uh, I mean, can't really go wrong with that. So, yeah, what else does it say? Reaching new cities first gives you additional benefits, and being the first to bridge the continent provides you with a sizable commission from your backers. However, those who build first are more the mercy of changing markets. Time your construction projects to maximize your profits and the flow of mana. So, seems like a Euro game set in the, you know, in the world of Indines. So that seems, that seems pretty cool. That was, I think, 13. Let's go with, yeah, 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 that was 13. Now let's go with 12. Now this is the game, excuse me, goddamn. Uh, that I actually have backed on Kickstarter, and I I spoke to the designers and the creators of this game. Oh yeah, it was Ben and Brad. Those guys were pretty cool. Uh, they were very nice. And I was talking to them about this game, and when it was going to be released, and they... I mean, it's, it's pretty much out of their hands at this point. So, the game is Victoriana. Now, theme pretty much is uh, playing another factor into this. And so I gave it a shot, and I backed it on Kickstarter, and now I'm just waiting for the release date. Uh, basically it's set in 19th century London, as Chandler forces are hatching a dire conspiracy. Queen Victoria has enlisted the aid of exceptional individuals to investigate the impending plot and save her realm from its calamitous consequences. So it seems like they took a lot of, let me see if I can find different people that they, that they threw in. Oh, they didn't. But, uh, they, they threw in a lot of, you know, people from this era and from different types of worlds together to work together to, you know, stop the evil forces of other villains within the, the these different worlds. So, and, and like, they have, uh, I know they have Sherlock Holmes, they have, I think, Mina Harker, so it's like those two already are like, what, what, How, you guys aren't even from the same thing, but it's like that same era of time that they're coming in. Uh, yeah, players move throughout London, marshalling and managing resources, investigating leads, and forwarding the agents of an unknown mastermind before time runs out. It also seemed like this was going to have a lot of replayability because of the different types of cards. You know, you're thwarting, um, basically, plots that, that the villain trying to find who is, you know, actually behind all this. It's kind of like Moriarty with Sherlock trying to figure out, hey, what's going on? Who's doing all this? And it ends up being him. But in this one... Players take the role of investigators that have influence within different realms of British society. Politics, science, occult, and the underworld. The conspiracy's three elements, mastermind, plot, and locale, are represented by cards and tokens selected in secrecy before the game begins. So it kind of has that almost deduction feel to it, with just a mishmash of different worlds being thrown in. And that just seems awesome. Just say novel-based. I wonder if that is actually true. So... Victoriana is my number 12. It would be higher, but... Oh, yeah, there's the Invisible Man. Yeah, actually, let me, let me see if I can open up the, uh, the picture and see if I can... I know Mina was one. You had, yeah, the Invisible Man. I think Sherlock. And then I don't know who, who that other one is. But it, I'm, I'm pretty excited for this one. Not as excited as the other 11. But let's just move on to number 11, which is a... Uh, I'm, I'm very excited for this, but I'm also weary just because of how long it's been. Victoriana, I've backed for a while too, and that's taken a while, and so has this one. So, saying it's going to be this year, but I understand why. So, this one is Dark Light Memento Mori, which is basically, uh, it says, brings old school dungeon crawler action with the with original dark gothic settings. So, I'm a huge fan of dark gothic. I think that uh, just that era and that world and that art is very uh, fascinating. 
And I do like dungeon crawlers if they are done well. Like, let's take um, like a game that had cool elements, but ultimately I didn't really care for, uh, Perdition's Mouth, which was another game I actually backed on Kickstarter. There were very, very good elements in that, but ultimately I didn't like everything else about it. Darklight Memento Mori seems like it's going to be pretty cool with taking that theme and throwing it in with also a, a like a mission setting or a campaign to where as you continue dungeon crawling and delving you get stronger and you upload, you upload, you upgrade your heroes and what our heroes are called a curse. Bound together by a twist of fate must fight their way through randomly generated dungeons to find lost treasure and acquire the souls of those they slay to extend their own life and use it as currency to survive in a world left in ruins. So, that seems interesting. Like, you may be, like, fading away. Uh, it's almost like, um, not, this, not necessarily Dark Souls, because you don't use souls. You're already undead. But you use souls to eventually become human, but then you can, like, fade back to undead if you die. Um, this one kind of feels that way, where from the way it's sounding, it was like you go through these randomly generated dungeons, which sounds awesome. I wonder how they're going to do that. And and go through and as you kill them you extend so you don't fade out. It could be like a way to manage resources. Um, each player will take on the role of one of the four dark heroes which must survive and find their way to the quest room in order to complete a specific objective and win their current mission. Many things will try to stop them from terrifying and grotesque monsters to unexpected traps or events lurking secretly in the dungeon. So, I don't know. The theme, once again, I'm, I'm big on theme. That's You guys probably know that from if you watch my channel. And the miniatures look awesome, and I think that's what's been holding up productions. I think they said something along like 60-something miniatures, and they look extremely detailed. A lot, yeah, just, I mean, sorry, you guys can't really see the picture, but you can definitely look. I'm pulling up all these games, by the way, on Board Game Geek. So, like, every game I mentioned, you can easily go find and look through the pictures. But the miniatures look pretty badass for a game that's not from a... Uh, major, you know, designer, uh, Dark Ice Games is the publisher, um, like, that's, I think that's what's held up this game so long, um, yeah, Memento War is a living experience within a dark and mysterious world full of deception and secrets, so, at some point I'll be getting this, and I'll be very excited to play it, because at my core, even though you guys probably are like, man, he bitches a lot about randomness and luck, I do, but it's kind of like a love-hate relationship, I love to, I love to bitch. So, then that was number eleven. Now we are actually on to the top ten games I'm excited for. This is actually number ten is a new one that I had heard about. Funny enough, uh, a couple days ago, and then had to look into it because I was like, "What?" And that is Stuffed Fables. Oh my god! Like another plaid hat game with like these cute, uh, just it's these just adorable things. And plaid hat tends to do these really weird. Um, Themes like uh, Stuffed Fables is pretty much the like sequel to Mice and Mystics almost. So Mice and Mystics, if you don't know, was a game that also delved around cute creatures killing and slaughtering each other uh, within a storybook world. Like it, it felt like it was a tale that you were reading, like that someone made up. Like there was there was those book series I don't remember where everyone was an animal, some type some type of animal, and but they were humanoid. And it was just a way, I think it's a neat way to disconnect from slaughter and mayhem. It's like, oh, it's not real people, it's adorable, innocent animals. That's, that's, that's not so bad. But, uh, so Mice and Mystics, anyway, were, were people that got shrunk down to mice and everything was to scale. So their shield was a button, and it's, it's just, it's fucking adorable. Uh, stuffed Fables seems to be pretty much that, except with stuffed animals. So... And is an unusual adventure game in which players take on the roles of brave stuffies seeking to save the child they love from a scheming evil mastermind. Like, come on, like, it can't get any more adorable than this. Uh, I wonder if it's the same designers as, uh, as Mice and Mystics. Um, I'll have to, I'll have to look that up. Let me, let me see real quick while I just rattle on about, about this. So we have, uh, yeah, Stuffed Fables, which I'm not even going to be able to. Mice and Mystics. Okay, so the designer for Stuffed Fables is Jer Jerry Hawthorne, um, and the artist is Regis Demi and Christine Pauline. So already from just the board game cover, the the art looks fantastic. And it's a really cool thing. Like, 
like my Mystics was that fairy tale kind of kind of world, the evil queen, you know, it's it's uh, the the evil witch from Snow White. Um, where uh, Stuff Fables is about, hey, the, we we're the animals of this little girl who is having nightmares, and we need to protect her. And uh, dang it, I clicked on you. And so that just seems awesome. Yep, Jerry Hawthorne did uh, did design my and Mystics, so. It's just going to get better from here. Uh, they actually have different artists. John Oroisa and David Richards did my some mystics. Um, anyway, so Stuffed Fables, I'm very excited for. I need to find out when that's actually being released, but um, it's going to be a campaign-driven game as well. And it seems um, it's the first adventure book game, a new product line from Playhouse Games in which all of the action takes place in the unique storybook. A book that acts as your rules reference, story guide, and game board all in one. Oh, so near and far. So it kind of does, kind of does that. Uh, that's interesting. That seems to be co the book open. The book opens flat onto the table to reveal a colorful map or other illust illust uh, illustration central to playing the game with choices, story, and special rules. So the more I look into this, the more I'm I'm, I'm excited for. So that's number ten. Uh, Stuff fables. Then you have number nine. Okay, so this is technically saying that it was 2017, but I uh, cannot find a copy, and if there is a copy, it's all for pre-order, so if every game that I can find for this, or every, you know, selling thing I can find for this is on pre-order, then it's not 2017. That's why it's this high up. Uh, and that's Hunt for the Ring. So, game by uh, publisher Ares, Ares Games, and it's set in Lord of the Rings. Now, Ares Games tends to do um, they actually did War of the Ring, which is one of my favorite games of all time, and I believe they also did Battle for Middle Earth, which a lot of people like. I personally didn't care for it, and then they did Sword and Sorcery, which once again didn't I didn't care for it, but a lot of people did. Hunt for the Ring, though, is a hidden movement game, which says played in two chapters, with each chapter being played on a different game board. In the first chapter, Frodo player attempts to move from the Shire to Bree, trying to if he gains corruption from from the Ring race chasing after him, then he loses. And then, if he uh, succeeds by getting to Bree, then they go to the second chapter, uh, which is Frodo, a player moving from Bree to Rivendell. So it's basically just that first section. You're not trying to get to Mortar, you're not trying to do any of that. You're literally just trying to run from the Ring Wraith. So it's a hidden movement game where, uh, you know, the one person is playing uh, the, 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 the Frodo, and the ring and the other people or person is playing the ring race. So, I love hidden movement. Uh, Leathers from My Chapel is great. Fury of Dracula is great. Spectre Ops is shit. Uh, but this one, I'm very excited for because I absolutely love Lord of the Rings. And that's why it's so high. It's because of that hidden movement, Lord of the Rings. So, if it's 2017, let me know. Um, and... Uh, and then I'll, um, then I'll look for a copy, but uh, everything seems to be on pre-order, so it'll come out in 2018. Uh, then we get to number 8, which is a game I also backed on Kickstarter. I, I should say, a lot of these games are on Kickstarter. That just seems to be the way uh, everything is, is going. Big companies are going through Kickstarter. Like, it's very rare. Like, Fantasy Flight, I don't think it's gone on Kickstarter. Um, but CMON has... Uh, newer publishers that that are making these like Gloomhaven, Cephalofair, like was on Kickstarter. You have Seven Continent, which was on Kickstarter. You have uh, uh, Folklore, uh, Greenbrier Games went back on Kickstarter. So all these amazing games that people are like creaming over are coming from Kickstarter, which is good because you can still get. Anyway, I did a whole video on Kickstarter. <laughs> Go watch that. I'm tired of repeating myself. Anyway. You guys want to know more about this game, which is Cine Tempore, or Sign Tempore, or however it's pronounced, uh, which is a very, it seems to me it's going to be a very unique game, cooperative game in which one of four players faces the game's artificial intelligence as part of a campaign, which guides them to one of three different endings, which is, which is pretty cool because uh, not a lot of campaign games actually have like that multiple path ending. Some of them are like, and way you make decisions, and as you, as you make decisions, you know, that'll lead you in one way, but ultimately it falls to the same thing. Or you have just campaign games where you level up and it has a finite ending. This one, uh, the way of saying about the, kind of like how the end system will, uh, end game system will help you to develop your characters through a modern tree skill system and a tested crafting mechanism inspired by Nova Atis. 
I don't know what that means. But uh, it's it's definitely set in in a sci-fi world with your own um, character that will that will progress and upgrade. And yeah, I mean, each mission has an objective that needs to be successfully reached to determine whether or not a territory has been conquered and whether or not a new sector can still be explored. So it seems kind of like that branching off world that has different, you know, missions that will, you know, play completely different. And I know I've been mentioning other things that are like, well, why is this one so high up versus the, the other ones? Well, one, just it is a unique world. Like Dark, Dark Gothic has been done before. Dungeon crawlers have been done before. This one seems to be pretty unique with its own with it, with its own theme. Um, also, it seems that it's going to have really really good miniatures from what I have uh, uh, seen uh, through the Kickstarter. But uh, this is also something that's going to be really cool. I don't know why I'm highlighting it because you guys can't see it. The final mission taken on by players will radically change their destiny. So I'm wondering if the choices you make at the end potentially can change something else. Like if you play again, if you made this decision, then you, I don't know. I don't know how it's exactly going to work. All I know is that something drew me to this. There was this game or Lords of Hellas that I could choose from whenever I was deciding which one to back. And some, for some reason, this one just uh, spoke to me. So, I mean, I'm working because it's at a 9.5. So, I mean, there's 76 ratings, but anyway. That was number 10, 9, 8, 8, right? Yep, that's Stuff Fables. Yep, so now we are on 7. That's funny, I didn't even plan on this actually being a thing, but number 7 is the second game by Level 99 called Seventh Cross, which is actually a, if I'm not mistaken, this is actually a, I could have sworn it was like a, not an anime or a, or a manga or some type of, uh, uh, you know, book or, or adaptation coming from somewhere, but this one is going to be awesome. It's that anime style feel, which a lot of their games have, which I love. I think it's so cool. But here's the theme. The year is 1920. Beneath the surface of society, an ancient and enigmatic church suppresses knowledge of the supernatural to protect the greater good of humanity and rega retain its grip on the world. Uh, you take on the role of a church hunter, a sworn defender of the world against the forces of darkness in Seventh Cross, and delve into the heart of evil as you explore your way through ever-changing castles filled with unique narrative. Doesn't that just sound awesome? Like that's the, like the world, the art is going to be fantastic. And here's here's the awesome thing: Seventh Cross is a roguelike exploration game for two to six players that combines elements of paragraph adventure games like Tales of Arabian Nights and exploration elements like Betrayal at the House on the Hill to form a Castlevania, Bloodborne, housing sort of narrative adventure. I'm done. That's it. Like, that's, that's it. That's awesome. Like, needs to come out. Now, I want it. And that's pretty much all I'm going to say about that. Then there is, that's all I have to say about that. You might, you guys might be thinking I'm being mean, but I'm quoting a fantastic movie, uh, so you guys can get over it. Now we are on number six, which is another game I backed on Kickstarter called Detective City of Angels. Essentially, L.A. Noir, the board game. Uh, this one is basically said 1940s Los Angeles, or Archer. Well, it's not right. No, Archer did an adaptation of, uh, of, of this noir kind of world. Um, I haven't really played a lot of board games that are set in this kind of, uh, kind of world. I mean, not even really a world set in this kind of era, which is 1940s, you know, detective. Uh, Los Angeles, where just murders are happening, and you're trying to figure out who was murdered, why, what connections they have to the uh, to the you know the murder victim, and you are doing that detective work. And I in this game, because I have seen it played, does that extremely well. They are able to get you that feeling of like, okay, well, hmm. But you're also competing. Well, you can play cooperative. Uh, but you could be competing, trying to figure out. Excuse me, who. Like, who can get the information the quickest? And But you're also kind of a shitty person to be able to do this stuff. So you can do some uh, unethical actions to be able to get the information that you need. Here's, here's the, cool, the cool thing about this that, that drew me to it. Detective City of Angels uses, uses the innovative ARC adaptive response card system to create the feel of interrogating a suspect. Suspects do not simply give paragraph book responses. Instead, the chisel carefully chooses how they will answer. When Billy O'Shea insists that the victim has, was a regular at Topsy's nightclub, is he telling you the truth, or is the chisel subtly leading the detectives toward a dead end that will cost them precious time? 
Detectives can challenge responses that they think are lies, but at great risk if they're wrong. The chisel will acquire leverage over them, making the case much harder to solve. So that in and of itself is like right up my alley. Like adds to Sherlock Holmes trying to figure out what you know where to go and what to do. On top of that, L.A. Noir, the Rockstar game. If you know anything about that, that had a that really great interrogation system where it's just like. Okay, well, like, how am I going to read them? If you don't have enough information, you're just going to be like, no, tell me, and then you're going to be wrong because the guy was like, no, I, I am a regular, you're me, motherfucker, and they're going to be pissed at you. So this is going to be really cool, a lot, and they can just do a bunch of expansions for it if they want to, but I backed it on Kickstarter, so I should be getting a lot, of some, get a lot of cool stuff. So that is number six. Number five, which I actually thought was going to be higher on this list, but... Man, there's a lot of good things coming out coming out this uh, this year. Obviously, these 20 games would be good enough for me, but I know there's going to be more. <laughs> and number five is a game that is going to be a Kickstarter exclusive uh, because of the theme, which is the number one reason why it's so high, and that is hate. So, funny enough, while I was actually doing, uh, I was trying to figure out who, uh, when this game was going on Kickstarter, and some guy commented on the question, I was like, hey, because my question was, when does hate... Uh, go on Kickstarter, and he was like, I think Kickstarter already gets it enough. I'm like, it's pretty funny. Uh, but Hate is is a game by Eric Lang and Simon, or Come On, and Guillotine Games that is coming from a graphic novel, and it is only a Kickstarter game because of how gruesome it is. Like, you think The Others is gross, that uh, people can still sell it, or like, oh no, that the game's too edgy. Uh, no. No, the, the lore of this is pretty much as vicious as it can come. Here is a description. They raped their mother, the Earth, and, and bound her with sorceress chains. The moon caught fire, the sun froze. In the veins of the world, her lifeblood choked to dust. The oceans boiled to uh, miasmus that clotted the skies. Rocks fanged up from the stubble of dying forests. As she began to rot, her creatures, her children, survived as best they could, tearing at each other, prowling in her fetid hollows, breeding abominations. Feasting on her, fungi and molds became sentient. But, I mean, that's just like, uh, I mean, that's just like an excerpt from this manga. Uh, yeah, the graphic novels acclaimed by Adrian Smith, Hate is a highly kinetic, endless, brutal campaign game of post-apocalyptic survival. Up to six players battle through a multi-game chronicle where they use their unique clan to savagely plunder, mutilate, and demoralize their opponents. Death is permanent for clan members. Once they die, they are out of the game. A player who most expertly uses savagery to upgrade their warriors and resources to unlock powerful new abilities from their village will win the game, but only the player with the most hate will become the tyrant and rule over the rest. It's going to be awesome. Like, of course, the miniatures are going to be awesome. This Kickstarter is going to be freaking expensive, but, uh... But that is what this game is going to be about, and I just want to delve into ugh, this world. Um, but it's going to be pretty brutal, and I know I'm going to want to do a, a uh, video, maybe a series, depending on how long the campaign is for the channel. Um, that's going to be age-rated, because like, I, I won't be able to just be like, hey, because some people may be like, hate? That seems, I mean, it's going to come off. That seems like a good game for my child. Let's, let's watch that, and then this is fucking insanity. But it seems really cool that you actually have permanent death for clan members. That's going to be a really neat mechanic. And also, going to be some pretty, uh, like, a high-level stress. But that is number five, hate. Number four is a game I also backed on Kickstarter that should be coming soon, actually. Uh, and it is Deep Madness. Deep Madness is basically a... It, it's Cthulhu. It seems... It's, it's, at least it's Cthulhu... Um, inspired, but it's, this is another dungeon crawl, but here's the thing, while this Kickstarter campaign was going on, and also while it was even done for a while, they would send out the most detailed and thematic, uh, uh, you know, emails out on, you know, new, uh, stretch goals that got unlocked, a new character, or a new creature, and they would be like long paragraphs of just making you feel claustrophobic, and, like, there was some where I was like, ooh, that's freaky, because it's set in a, a deep-sea mining site. Uh, the uncovering of a mysterious sphere is dragging everyone nearby into the endless madness. Uh, yeah, in a dark and claustrophobic uh, world. Uh, let's see. Uh, la, 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 la. Yeah, Deep Madness is a fully cooperative board game for one to six players with 66 amazingly detailed miniatures. That's where I got the 66 from depicting a sci-fi horror world inspired by Lovecraft's work in the Alien series. 
Cthulhu and Alien, I mean, that's, that's pretty badass. So, I know you guys are like, well, theme doesn't mean everything. That's true, but that's pretty much all you kind of have to go off, at least for me, in this, in this top 20, that, okay, well, we'll see how the game works. Um, but I know for a fact that this game is, one, campaign-driven, and it is also going through these phases that deal with insanity and claustrophobia and just different mechanics that make the world feel alive. Like, uh, let's see. Yeah, there's actually a lot of, of uh, detail in this. But you have uh, different phases, devour phase, uh, progress, progress is one step forward along the devour track, indicating the world going deeper into madness. As the devour marker progresses, more and more rooms are flipped to their madness side. These rooms will spawn monsters and provide various nasty effects to hinder the investigators. So you kind of want to get through as quickly as possible before the world and map, in this case, starts uh, becoming extremely more difficult because as everyone starts slinking, sinking into madness. Yeah, based on multiple scenarios from a continuous storyline, each scenario has its own unique board setup, rules, special effects, and goals. From resolving fatal crises to struggling with overwhelming bosses, the investigators will face various quests filled with strategical decisions and fierce combat. Huh. <sighs> so, it's, it's gonna be, I think it's gonna be a, be a blast, and the miniatures also look extremely detailed for this. So, I'm a sucker for minions, I'm a sucker for theme, so, ultimately, Here's the thing, whenever it comes to board games, it's like, theme draws people, mechanics keep people. Uh, which is true, I would say, 90% of the time, but there are times where I'm like, yeah, I don't really care about uh, that theme, like World of Move or something, but if the th or uh, that mechanic, but if the theme is good enough, I can overlook it. Now, number three, which is brand new uh, to, to the uh, uh, list and to everyone's, you know, knowledge, but skyrocketed up to this list, and it is Scythe, the Rise of Fenry, or Fenris. Uh, oh my god, like, and the final, si Ooh! <laughs> I'm so excited for this one. <laughs> the, the, it's, it, it's the third and final expansion for Scythe. Scythe is my, uh, is one of my favorite games of all time, and, like, it's just, it's just, I can't wait because here's, here's what this does. One, it, it adds, um, you know, modular, uh, like, or it, it adds modules. Uh, instead of or after, uh, the new modules in the Rise of Fenrir can be used in various combinations to cater to player preferences. So a lot of people worried that Scythe would become stale, which uh, I have not found, but the Wind Gambit actually added, uh, you know, uh, modules that can uh, alter the way the game ends, were, and also added the big ass ships that also affect how you would play. Then, with this one, it adds more modules. So hey, uh, no, it's not going to get stale. And here's here's why it's at number three. It adds a campaign, like a campaign to Scythe. Are you? <laughs> like, Story of Scythe continues and concludes with an eight episode campaign, and it's only eight games, which is which. You know, for me, I'd you would think I'd be like. Oh god, why aren't there 50? Well, because I'll never get to play all 50. Because um, I can't play this by myself. Well, I mean, I guess I could with the brilliant Automa system. But I don't want to do that. I want to be able to play this with a group and do a series for you guys on the channel. Eight games, that is very doable. The Story of Scythe continues and concludes with an eight episode campaign. While the campaign includes surprises, unlocks, and persistent elements, it is fully resettable and playable. Oh my god, you get that feeling of a legacy game, but you don't actually have to destroy the board, especially with how I have the Kickstarter stuff. Oh my god, like, you guys have no idea when I, this was just announced, I think today, actually. And uh, it comes out, oh, uh, when was the release date? Uh, quarter four, I want to say? Quarter three or quarter, quarter four, it cannot get here soon enough. But, yep, yep. I, I can't wait. You guys have no idea. So that is uh, Scythe, The Rise of Fenrir. I thought it was Fenrir at first, and I was like, okay, well, that's weird. But anyway, here is number two. Number two is based off of a game I actually did a series for. Not a series, a run-through for. And it is uh, one of my absolute favorite deck builders, uh, which is not many. And that is Aeons and Legacy. Yes, so... One of the best deck builders I would say on the market, and I've played, I have played a lot, I just don't like them. Aeon's End is still one of my favorites, and oh my god, a legacy version of that? Like, are you kidding me? That, like, 
Like, that's just, I, and I know a lot of people are going to be like, another legacy, but I don't want to, just shut the fuck up. Okay. Legacy games are amazing. Like, you get an absolute, but I can't play it again. Okay, first of all, no one plays, like, not, not no one, but a lot of people don't play these games over and over and over and over, where it's like, you're going to get, Pandemic Legacy in those, you're going to get 12 to 20 games from a $6 price point. Like, so with Aeons and Legacy, which is a standalone expansion, it can also be played with the, uh, the other, you know, versions of War Eternal and the base, just Aeons End. This one comes with a campaign-driven story legacy game to where you actually get to create a... It, it seems to be more character-focused, but I'm sure that that's not going to be the only thing. But your character, what does it say? You are not yet breach mages. Brahma lectures as she paces down the line of hopefuls. They're called hopefuls. Her seemingly frail form belaying the truth of her immense power. If you wish to stand amongst living legends such as Malastar, Zaxos, Desmodia, and assist in staying the doom that wraps on Gravehold's buckling doors, then you must listen and learn. The nameless shall come, and we all need you to be ready. You are our best hope. Legacy, Aeons and Legacy is a standalone game and expansion for Aeons and that contains a full campaign that plays out over multiple sessions. At the end of the campaign, you will have created a customized character with unique starting cards, player abilities, and you can use those in the other games. So even if it was character-focused, the campaign that's pulling uh, this world allows you to create your own character, and that's, that's just awesome. Like, you just have to pay one game that is usable in other iterations of this game. And so even just for that, even if the campaign was just, hey, fight a different monster each time, you're going to, at the end, look at your character that you're like, this is awesome, and go fight other nameless ones. I, you guys have no idea, this is awesome. Like, I, I saw this and I was like, you gotta be kidding me. Uh, and I knew it was gonna get shit because of that one-time play. It's like, I wouldn't understand if people complain about legacy games and they were like literally $60 one game and you trashed the board then. That's fine. But no one seems to complain about Time Stories or Sherlock Holmes or, uh, what's it, the Unlock Exit games. Well, actually, more the Exit games. But it's like... So you're getting more bang for your buck with a legacy campaign game. But that's the thing, is like, have, how many games have I mentioned here that feature campaigns that, I mean, they're becoming more and more integrated in, in board games because, like, video games are starting to be shitty. Not all of them, but that's, that's my opinion anyway. So if I can play awesome campaigns in a, in a hobby that I love, and also occasionally get to destroy stuff of the game and, and feel like I'm making a difference, uh, then I will gladly do that. So that's why it is my number two, Aeon's End Legacy. And it really shouldn't be that anyone's surprised what my number one uh, anticipated game of 2018 is um, because of how much I love the game it seems to be pretty much based off of, and that is Rising Sun, another come on game. Uh, by Eric Lang. Uh, uh, that is actually not as gruesome as uh, uh, Hate. Um, so, Rising Sun, also on Kickstarter, is basically Blood Rage, but Feudal Japan. And me personally, I love Feudal Japan in that kind of world more than I like Vikings. So, now don't get me wrong, Vikings are cool, and Blood Rage is an amazing game. It's in my top 10 games of all time. And Rising Sun is just that, but with, yeah, it's, it's not just that, but it adds these uh, amazing oh, oh, yokai that you can use these, and all these, not yokai, um, what are they called in here? Uh, kami. Kami that you get to try and harness your powers just like the monsters in Blood Rage to your own, uh, to, to aid you in this area control game, but here's what it adds. It adds diplomacy, which, um, which allows you to basically, which is kind of like almost your currency, I, I, I feel like, uh, which allows you to do certain things within the game. You can tackle negotiations, alliance, and war. You capture hostages and commit seppuku. Game features an honor track in which you can rise and fall based on your behavior. So how you want to play your clan, which already starts off unique, versus Blood Rage where you card draft to make your clan unique, this game seems to feature uh, a lot more into it, and the miniature is once again it's Simon, so it's going to be amazing. Um, I don't know, like, there's something about this that draws it to definitely number one because, uh, because of that theme, and because I know how strong Blood Rage was, and how 
uh, how solid of a game and, and the you know mechanics that worked. This is going to be a, I, I think it's going to be awesome. Like it may beat out Blood Rage because of one theme and just the way it feels like it's going to do. Where you have you're you're kind of like that Legend of the Five Rings world where you're your specific clan that allows you to do things. Plus, get the help of Kami while also I believe Yokai. I want to say Yokai are in this game. But using your own, you, you know, your own different figurines to be able to take over different areas and also, yeah, you know, an ally with someone and then you can, you can break that ally, which will, you know, probably dishonor you. So the honor system is going to be really, really intriguing to work with. Um, that, that, I mean, that, that's why it's my number one. Like, Rising Sun is a game that as soon as I heard about it, I was like, and I heard about this a while ago, that I was like, I immediate back, like full, full pledge, I want this because it, it, I know it's going to be good. But that is it, everyone. That was my top 20 anticipated games of 2018. This is going to be a awesome year. Like, I, I honestly cannot wait for, for these games to come out and, uh, and, and, and other games. So here's the thing. Let me know of any games that you know of that are coming out that wasn't on this list, what games you're excited for for 2018. And, I mean, if you want to see it on the channel, like, I'm not above, you know, not buying... It's like, if you guys want to see it, I'll, I'll get it. I'll, I'll figure out a way to get a copy um, to do a run-through and, and, you know, discussion and everything for it. Uh, 2018 is, is going to keep um, keep this, uh, this channel alive pretty much because of the games that are coming out that my hobby's not sedating. It's... I'm being more strategic about the games that, that I order instead of just what I used to do, which is just buy a bunch and then be like, oh, hey, I actually don't know nothing about this. But it's I'm very, very excited because 2017 was successful for the channel. 2018, is only, it's only going to go up from there. And uh, that's all because of, of you guys who, who watch the channel and, and continue to subscribe. So uh, thank you very much for that. Now, once again, any games that you're excited for in 2018, and if you think, hey, based off this list, oh, you'll like this one, I'll, I'll write it down. I'm keeping, I'm gonna keep a log for games that I come across to to look into because obviously at the end of the year I need to do a game, you know, best, you know, games of, of that year. So that's it, everyone. Uh, I hope you enjoyed. Um, I didn't say this at the beginning, but Happy New Year. Uh, once again, 2018 is gonna be awesome. I'm very much looking forward to it. But other than that, like, comment, share, and subscribe, and have a wonderful whatever time of day it is for you. Hey everyone, thank you for watching, and I really hope that you enjoyed the video. If you want to support us, you can go ahead and click that link to go to my Patreon account. If you have any suggestions, you can go ahead and click the link in the show notes below to go to my board game geek, geek list. Other than that, like, comment, share, and subscribe, and have a wonderful whatever time of day it is for you.